Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. I graduated last, last year with a PGCE in mathematics teaching. This is the third year that I've been teaching. And a lot of you have asked me a lot of questions about it as to why I went into teaching after my PhD. And I'll briefly talk about it now, but if you do have more questions about PGCE, NQT, um, anything to do with teaching and the whole teaching process, please do leave me questions down below and I might do a whole Q&A video on it. And there's a bit of an overlap between when I started teaching and when I did my PhD. So I was kind of doing both at one point. Um, and then I fully started last year and then last year was my NQT year. Which means you're a newly qualified teacher and then this year I'm fully qualified. I, um, yeah, I teach math. Like I said, a lot of you have asked me why I went into that field when I could have just gone straight into it after my BSc. Um, and it's a good question. I would probably ask the same as well. Being a teacher is such a rewarding career to be in, even if you, want to do it full time and forever. I think it's absolutely amazing and I would want all of my kids to have teachers who have PhDs and who are knowledgeable and who are inspirational and who have done so much in their lives that they want to inspire other ch uh, you know children to be better human beings. I taught a range of different people throughout my life. I've taught in university, so I've taught adults, taught children, I've tutored so much, um, I proofread, I, I work on the fringe of education as well in terms of proofreading, editing, etc., consulting, other services. I kind of know that education is the road that I would go down, didn't know exactly what field or exactly in what capacity, but I always knew that I would be an educator somehow. Working in a school means that I'm able to be exposed to the way that schools are run today the way that policies are translated into a school and the way that impacts a school such as a school in you know within london and for me i know that i've got a phd i can always go back to university literally if i quit my job i can get a job in university tomorrow that's not a problem and that's not something that i worry about the past couple of years i have been interested in educational policy i really do want to work with the government to be able to be someone who impacts thousands of lives and to be able to do that I want to work in policy now I know a lot of people I know a lot of policy makers are either people who are super old and who have no idea about the universities or the school system right now um, and who are privately school private school educated um, so they've got no absolutely no idea or they have never worked or they've never been teachers and they've never worked in schools they've never been lecturers they've never worked in a university they have no idea what goes on in an educational sphere and I think university and school teaching from what I've because I've been in both sides they're quite similar they're yeah essentially very similar just one's being delivered to children one's being delivered to um, adults in terms of planning and everything it was pretty much the same what I did in both aspects I, I was lucky enough to find a scheme where it enabled me to not work full time but be paid full time so I'm able to work um, as a teacher for some days of the week um, but also have some time off to be able to work towards some research that I want to do and I, it could be really on anything and this year I'm actually conducting some research um, educational research and I'm learning more about the social sciences because social sciences and biological sciences are very very different in terms of research and I'm actually going back to university so I'm going to Sheffield University to learn more about social science research and I will be collecting some more master credits that I should be able to use and graduate with soon. Anyway that's a very short kind of explanation as to what it is that I want to do in the long term. I also know that right now a lot of new PGCEs, a lot of new PGCEs are starting and a lot of new NQTs are starting and I just wanted to say good luck for this year. I'm sure you guys will do amazingly. I'm sure that you'll have an amazing year. It is such an amazing profession to be in. There is no easy job. <laughs> That's just how I see things. As long as you enjoy it, as long as you um you know understand the purpose and the reason why you're there to be able to see kids more than their parents even see their own child. You are the person that they are seeing. So it really is um, an honor. And thank you if you are entering the profession because we definitely need more teachers, um, more good teachers to be in. So I'm gonna be giving 10 tips for surviving the NQT slash PGC year. I know they're very different, but I'm talking about in school. So actually surviving the year in terms of things that I did. So tip number one is to collect evidence as you go along. So you are assessed against the teaching standards um, as you I'm sure you know and or you'll definitely be finding out soon and um, so you make sure that you are collecting evidence as you go along don't wait for the assessment period in May or whenever it is to then try to scramble through your emails and find the relevant information if you get an email from the head of department saying well done for being you know so great and attentive during parents evening print that out 
teaching standard part two um if you get an email from a feedback some sort of feedback or observation email from someone even if it's just a line saying really great in your lesson when i popped in i saw that you were doing this that that bins out teaching standard four if you see a student um doing really good work and you've corrected it and it's a really good layout and you can see that there's some sort of like learning progression or you challenge that student take a photo of it on your phone print it out label it with teaching standard whatever it is and just keep on going like that throughout the year and what that means is when you get to the end of the year you've got all of that evidence there and also means that you have a kind of like a variety of evidence um as opposed to at the end you probably only would have the feedback that your line manager you know gave you from the report the final observation whereas this way you've got emails you've got student books you've got so much information that you can you know show evidence for, for every teaching standard i don't think i spent very long on my folder um at the end because i just kind of collected as i went along and really 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 secondly helped. be vocal about what works and what doesn't work make sure that you build a relationship with your line manager or head of department where you are able to say that this class is challenging can you come and observe me can you come and see what i'm doing right can you come and give me some tips? Can you tell me where I can improve? If what they're suggesting isn't great, you try it out. If it's not great, say it's not working. Don't suffer in silence. Most schools, I would say, are super supportive and are there to help you. So don't suffer in silence. If something isn't working, if the students aren't cooperating, if you're not feeling like you are progressing, then definitely, definitely speak up about it. Do not suffer in silence because by the time you get to the end of the year, if you haven't progressed, then you will fail the year. Um, and it's much better to speak earlier and be observed more and progress than not thirdly don't allow yourself to be undermined by other staff members now i know this is quite hard because you are obviously a new trainee teacher and there are teachers there that have been there for probably 10 20 sometimes more years um and some of them have very different views on how teaching should be research now shows that a lot of things that we traditionally used to be told to do so for example marking books research actually shows that marking books is a complete waste of time feedback is more important in terms of whole class feedback or feedback in terms of um, giving feedback to a large number of students um, based on what you see but actually ticking and kind of marking books individually uh, is actually outdated remember to do everything professionally everything by email and always cc your line manager so nothing is sort of hidden and everything's out and this is probably gonna be really controversial and um some some people might 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 be shocked but don't take any work home just give that to yourself as a boundary set a boundary where you say i am not taking work home i'd rather stay at work till six o'clock till seven o'clock till eight o'clock get it done and then go home and have me time or you know me my family time at home but the problem occurs when it's all blurred and I think this is the case with any career any job um, when it's all blurred of course there are some times when you have to like during assessments when there's a lot of marking to do I'd much rather just go home and do it from the TV that's fine that's once you know in a few months that's not a problem but when it comes down to everyday planning work planning lessons marking work etc and you're taking it all home then it starts to become a problem and I think it's important to remember that teachers have so many jobs uh, it's not a it's not a job where you have a few different things to do and you can do it side by side you can do hit this and start that it's not like that when you're teaching in a classroom you can only teach you can't plan a lesson while you're teaching you can't mark books while you're teaching you can only teach and then when you're planning a lesson you can only plan you can't teach a lesson while you're planning right so you kind of have these like separated jobs that you cannot overlap in any way so it is quite difficult but there is a lot of spare time during the day so during the day you should have at least one hour free or maybe two hours um, if you're a newly qualified teacher then you should have at least two hours uh, a day or one that's free use that time wisely don't use that time to chat in the staff room about some student that did something it's not that's not relevant it's not productive it doesn't lead to any anything um, so it's much better to spend that time planning in that time you can plan the next lesson or tomorrow's lessons or print out whatever you need to print out for the next day just make sure you're spending your time wisely as opposed to just chit chatting about things that are happening that is very easy to do it's very easy to go and rant about this student that student but it really isn't productive so use your time wisely do not take work home make that your line make that your line and that is my line and like i said i've never taken work home and on the same vein 
Tip number five is that perfection doesn't exist. And I think this is the problem. A lot of us go into teaching and we might have PhDs or we might have degrees and we are used to having an A-star essay or we're used to having a 2-1 or a first or whatever it is. And you're used to that level of perfection. It doesn't exist in teaching. You can't produce a lesson that's perfect, that has perfect, you know, AFL, that has perfect pedagogy, that's, you know, that, that touches upon every single need of every single student in that room. Like, of course that's the ideal, but it doesn't happen. And I think sometimes it's okay to let little things slip. It's not okay if there's a student in that class that has a specific need um, for their work to be differentiated for you to let that slip. That's not okay because that's a whole hour that that student is now missing out on. And in fact, that means that you've neglected that student's need. That's not okay. But it's okay if the colours are not um, all matching. It's okay if the work isn't mo the most exciting or the most fun, that's okay. It's not okay if there's a student in that class that has a specific need um, for their work to be differentiated for you to let that slip, that's not okay because that's a whole hour that that student is now missing out on and in fact that means that you've neglected that student's need, that's not okay. But it's okay if the colours are not um, all matching. It's okay if the work isn't mo the most exciting or the most fun, that's okay. Every lesson can't be fun and, and, and you know, innovative and you know, creative, but there are certain things that I think you just need to allow to the side. And I think I learned this very quickly because I am a perfectionist. <laughs> I, can, I, I put my hand up and I say that I am a perfectionist. I'm, as long as the information that you have is correct and you're teaching the appropriate information, it really doesn't matter if the font size is not correct or it's not the correct font or it's comic sans like it's okay <laughs> um, and I think that's something that you just need to remember and again that just minimalizes minimalizes how much time you spend on each the sick tip is to observe other teachers um, who teach students that you might teach so you might have a class that another really good teacher good experienced teacher has as well um, and you have a lot more time during your PGC and your NQT year than you will have later to be able to observe other teachers so you don't have to spend the whole hour then I think that's something that I learned as well that you don't have to go in and sit there for the whole hour but you can just go in and sit and see how you can just go in and see how he or she brings the class in and starts them off or how he or she ends the lesson or how they do a discussion during the lesson and again I'd recommend you to go and look at other subjects not just your own subjects because students act and behave differently in different subjects it's just interesting to see what the differences are. Is it where they're sitting? Is it how the teacher is teaching them? Is it the the work? Is it just the way it's laid out? What is it that's making this child act differently in my class as they do in depth in that class? The seventh tip. Always have some water in the classroom. Seventh tip is to follow any behaviour policies that you have in your school. Some schools are super strict um, and have super, you know, structured policies. Follow them. They're there to support you. They're there to support the progress and the learning of the of the students. And they're there to support you as a teacher to be able to allow you to actually teach. So don't think, oh, I'm going to go and do my own thing. Then go and change school because you won't be you're not gonna be in an environment that is supporting you if you don't like the policy. The next tip, tip number eight, is do not reinvent the wheel. I, this is one thing that I didn't understand. Coming from a science like background, as in coming from a lab-based background where I was constantly using other people's protocols, you ask, if, if you read a paper and you like the work, you ask them for the protocol, or you ask them for more details, you email them. Your protocols are just shared, methods are shared, materials are shared. I don't need to reinvent the way that I do a Western blot. It's already, it's been done. Um, and one thing that I found in schools is that we're constantly reinventing the wheel. We're constantly re we're constantly all doing the same thing. Um, there should just be a bank of lessons that everyone can use, a bank of good lessons that everyone can use. Why is it that me, you, 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 a hundred teachers around the country are all planning the same lesson? It, it doesn't make sense. Um, and I think it's naive to think that you can just pick up a lesson and just do it. Obviously you have to adapt it to your class, you have to adapt it to your, the, your teaching style, um, to, your, to the structure of your lesson, 
to the different needs in, in the class. Of course, you can never just pick up a lesson and run with it. No one's suggesting that. Maybe, I, maybe I'm missing something. Do correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I do think that it is really important for us to share and to collaborate. And I think it doesn't happen enough, but it is happening a lot more than it used to in schools. By entering a school, don't be afraid to ask someone in your department if they have lessons where it could be on a shared drive or it could be their lessons if they're willing to give it to you hopefully they are it doesn't make sense if they, if they don't but um yeah if just ask someone in your department and say or someone even on your course if their school has it because the curriculum is the same as long as obviously it's the right exam board so there's no reason why you can't use a lesson from a different school it's all the same information but again just make sure that you are looking through the slides making sure it has the correct and the, the appropriate amount of challenge for that class, the appropriate amount of differentiation, um, that it is at the right level, obviously, for your class. But otherwise, you shouldn't need to say, right, I've got a lesson tomorrow, let me start from a blank PowerPoint. It should never, ever be like that. My ninth tip is not to judge the profession based on your experience in one school. And teaching has a very high dropout rate, extremely high. Um, within five years, I think something like 40-50% of teachers have left the profession completely. And I think it's quite sad because it is a profession that a lot of people come into because they love, they want to teach and then they get bombarded with bombarded with all the other, you know, bureaucracies and they end up leaving. Um, and I think it's really important for you not to judge the whole profession based on one school. Yes, you will come across horrible people. Of course, you'll come across schools that are maybe not supportive, that don't have great colleagues. Instead, try a different school, even if it's just for a term, try to go somewhere else, see if somewhere else suits you a bit better and ask around to see what kind of school it is. Um, Cause now obviously you know what you don't want, so you know what you might want. And my last tip is to make allies, so make friends uh, within the school. So that could be colleagues, that could be teachers from other departments. Um, I would say most, I would say try to get out of your department a little bit. Um, try to meet other teachers and um, other staff members so facility staff um, reprographic staff just anyone really that you see around you and um, the librarian uh, definitely try to make friends because it just means that you can walk around school and you're not a nobody you're someone who can say hi and can walk around and you know have a conversation how was your weekend um, and kind of continue conversation it's really difficult because you're so you spend so much time with the kids that you don't have much time to actually make friends with the adults <laughs> especially if you don't go to like the pub and things like that it can be quite difficult but I definitely say to make friends with staff that no, not necessarily always the teaching staff either I speak to most of the non-teaching staff to be honest um, just because I find that you see them more around the school than the teachers because teachers are usually in their classrooms and when you need help they're the ones that you go to so <laughs> make friends it actually blows my mind that this is the third year so time just goes super fast so make sure that you're making the most of it no regrets have fun, kids are amazing, students are amazing. I've had some of the most amazing conversations conversations with students and I feel like I've found myself as a person a bit more over the past couple of years as well. I really hope that you guys enjoyed it. Do leave me a comment down below and let me know if you're starting to teach this year or if you're thinking of, of being a teacher in the future. And like I said, um, do leave me any questions down below and if I have enough questions, I'll make a QA and a because I know that's probably a lot of things that you guys wanna know in terms of maybe how I got onto it, the scheme, um, pay, I don't know, whatever it is that you want to know, just leave me questions down below and hopefully I'll do a whole video. If it's not, then I'll just reply back to you individually down below. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys, hope you guys like that. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and I'll see you guys in my next one. Bye!